All right, good afternoon, everybody. Here with uh, Josh and Paul. It's been a few days, so got some uh, three days of numbers to share with you. Uh, in addition, we have uh, two guests. Uh, one is Fran Rabinowitz. She oversees all the public school superintendents. I thought Fran would be a great um, person to share with us today because it was about two weeks ago that we put in place our our 50-page uh, back-to-school uh, strategy, and Fran has shared that with all the superintendents. They're going to get back to us with more specifics and uh, budgets in the next uh, week or two, but she can give us sort of a half-day report. And uh, back by popular demand is uh, Dr. Carter, Matt Carter. Matt, as you know, is the chief epidemiologist for the state of Connecticut, and Science sometimes, I guess, the back of the hand in Washington, D.C., but not in Hartford. We're trying to lead with our scientists. Matt's going to give you an update on where he thinks we are today, uh, looking at the metrics. Um, on Thursday, we're trying to get Scott Gottlieb back. You maybe remember Scott uh, helped advise our reopen committee and uh, give the best scientific advice we can share with you in terms of what's going on. This three-day summary is um, maybe interesting just in a couple of fronts. I, I suppose 23 fatalities jumps out of the page at, at me. Uh, I want you to know um, that tragic number really reflects the fact that there were six fatalities reported in the last three days and 17 that are uh, backed up over the course of the last few weeks as we get um, you know, caught up with some of the funeral homes and other certificates coming in. Hospitalizations over the uh, last three days. Um, I told you that's going to bounce around since we're close to the bottom, but negative three shows you uh, we're still in good shape there with plenty of capacity. Still good time to go in and get that elective surgery maybe you thought about putting off. And finally, we've done about 10,000 tests a day, 31,000 tests over the last three days, 223 positives, which Josh tells me is about 0.7%. So our positivity rate, the percentage of folks we test who test positive for COVID is still very low, one of the lowest in the country, and less than 1%. And over the last uh, week, it's about 0.8%. So, um, so far, so good. Um, the next chart is something you've seen before. It shows you hospitalization statewide. Um, Max added in April 20th, which is the date that we put in place our mandatory mask order where you can't maintain six feet of social distancing outside. And um, uh, I think it shows you the good uh, direction we've been in for a while. Numbers you cannot take for granted. I mean, I've been surprised by a couple of things since uh, well, last we talked. Um, one, I, I thought maybe once you got hit by the storm, your back side of the storm, we had weathered the storm and you'd be okay. And then I look at states like Louisiana and Washington State, which were hit early, you know, as was Connecticut, and they're getting hit a second time now. So it reminds me, it's not like a region builds up an immunity. You have to stay uh, very cautious. Um, also, I say, you know, look, it's down there in Florida and Texas, those southern states. Doesn't probably impact us as much here in the Northeast. You know, we've been good. Well, watch out. I mean, Delaware has spiked up quite a bit. Pittsburgh is uh, spiking up now. This is not hardly, you know, the Northeast region, but it does show you you still have pockets where you have to be uh, extraordinarily careful. And uh, because of that, um, working with New York, we decided to um, toughen up our quarantine from those highly infected states. Um, it's worth noting that, well, air travel from, say, Florida and Texas and Arizona and another dozen states uh, is down 70 percent since COVID. It's down another 50 percent since we put in place our quarantine. So I think that's having a good effect. That's obviously Bradley here, as well as JFK and LaGuardia and um, Newark Airport. But working with New York, we're going to um, be announcing a strong certification policy as well, so that when uh, you're on that plane, you have to certify. Um, we know where you're coming from, but where you're going to be staying, how you're going to be quarantining, who you are traveling with, and uh, you'll be filling out that form and giving it to us, uh, you know, when you land. If we find somebody's uh, tested positive on the flight or otherwise, makes it easier for us to track and trace and uh, make sure that we um, keep an eye on things. This is another good time, continuing time to be cautious. Um, 
I guess it's worth noting on the good news front, New York City had uh, zero fatalities in the last couple of days, last day anyway. That's extraordinary considering where New York City was just three months ago. I did notice that um, Disney World in Orlando opened with a great pomp and circumstance uh, this weekend. At the same time, ironically, Hong Kong Disneyland closed down. So it's a map that's moving back and forth, which we're tracking very carefully. And the next chart I'll leave you with before introducing Fran is just a reminder that things change. And uh, California, which was one of the first states, and they put in place some pretty strict protocols and took them seriously. And just uh, today, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, announced that in most counties, they're going to be turning back the clock, turning back the clock on indoor dining and movies, and a lot of what we had as part of our phase three uh, just about a month ago. And also, you see here, Los Angeles and San Diego schools to go online only this fall, despite heavy pressure coming from uh, uh, the Trump administration. Uh, you know, with that, I say that because we still have very low metrics compared to San Diego and LA and most of these other states. We're in a unique position so far to be able to open our schools uh, online, on time I should say, uh, and most of the kids going back into the classroom, those that don't feel comfortable being able to learn at home. But obviously that's going to be subject to where we are a month from now. And that's why Fran Rabinowitz is here to tell you what she's hearing from the superintendents. And then Matt Carter will be here to answer any questions you have uh, from the epidemiology point of view. Fran, what are you hearing from the superintendents? Thank you, Governor. And good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I work uh, hand in hand with the superintendents. Um, I probably talk with at least 100 of them a week. And here's what I know. They are taking the plan and they're taking it apart. They're beginning, we have three different options. We're hoping um, to bring back all of the children because we know, as everyone knows, that there is nothing more effective than having um, the children in their classes with their teachers. So we're watching the science very carefully we want to bring them all back, but what I guess I want everyone to know that is that the superintendents and their teams are working to do that, but only if it's healthy and safe for every child and every teacher and every leader. We're looking at five different ways. Um, we're looking at hand washing, sanitizing, cohorting, face coverings, and social distancing. No one of them is a magic bullet, but we're taking all of them together and to produce a safe and healthy environment. And again, it's with the science. We're looking at the data trends. We also are working on a hybrid model. If in fact the data ticks up and we realize we cannot bring all the children back and keep our staff and children safe, we will go to a hybrid model we'll, where we will bring some children in some days, others on distance learning and, um, and bring them in on other days, uh, different grades at different times. And thirdly, if in fact we are like Los Angeles and San Diego, if um, and we hope this does not happen, but if the data shows us that we have to go to online learning, we will be prepared for that in the best way possible. And we are um, preparing district by district for that. Every district is somewhat different. We want to be sure that all the um, students have um, uh, connection. We want to be sure that they have the hardware they need, and we want to be sure that we have excellent content and strategies for them. So yes, we have been incredibly busy and we will continue to be busy over the summer. Um, what is difficult, and I just wanna be very honest, is it's there's ambiguity here, right? I mean, we can't be 100% sure of any model and that's why we have to make every model as uh, wonderful as it can be for our children. And um, the objective is to keep them healthy and safe. 
Well, thank you, Fran. And with that, Max, uh, any questions? And ask some tough ones of Dr. Carter. NBC Connecticut. Yes, good afternoon. Regarding the certification policy, Governor, what's the enforcement on that to make it not just a piece of paper? Are you considering checking in on people where they're saying if they're quarantining like they're supposed to? Would you be giving the certification to local law enforcement? I mean, would those tested within a certain period of time be able to avoid quarantining? Uh, right now, um, when you get off the plane, you're going to have to uh, self-certify. This is where you're going to quarantine. Maybe there'll be a state police officer nearby just to remind people how seriously we're taking this. We have opp opportunity we can call in just to make sure you're where you're supposed to be when you quarantine. I know that Andrew is thinking about uh, some fines in case people uh, uh, abuse the quarantine methodology, and we'll be figuring that out over the next uh, week or so. Um, for Fran, what do you feel like is the likelihood of option one of bringing everyone back to the classroom? I know there's a lot of concerns from teachers. There's a lot of concerns from parents. You know, others have tried and they've actually had to shut schools down. Well, right now, given where we are in Connecticut as one of the best states, um, right now it is looking good to be able to bring students back um, uh, in a, into a safe and healthy environment. And what I am doing and what we're doing as superintendents is working every day with our teachers and our teacher unions to assure them that we want all the kids back, as do they, as do the families. But honestly, it has to be a safe and healthy environment. Right now, the data is showing us that, but that data could change tomorrow. And we, we are very cognizant of that. And then my last question for Dr. Carter, what is your level of concern for the coming fall with the flu adding into the mix? We appear to have lost Dr. Carter. He'll be back shortly. We'll move on and we will have, uh, we'll get back to Dr. Carter with that question once he logs back in. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, a real quick question for the governor, maybe even um, Ms. Rabinowitz. You know, New York says that they're not going to reopen their schools unless the infection rate is below 5%. Is Connecticut going to be doing the same? And will that same criteria be used here? A similar criteria. I've, I've got to talk to the experts about what those metrics are going to be. I think New York decided they're not going to give any guidance until August when they see what the numbers are. You know, I think uh, Miguel and Fran and our team decided, look, assuming we keep our numbers in a good place, uh, this is what you should count on in terms of in-school opening in the fall. And is there a plan, if needed, going to the uh, travel quarantine, is there a plan to maybe track out-of-state drivers coming in? Uh, we're not there at this point. Um, I think most of those drivers don't drive up from Florida, per se, but maybe they would rent a car at LaGuardia Airport or something. And there, New York is going to be tracking them uh, carefully, and we coordinate with them, with New York. News 8. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, before I ask you about Johns Hopkins today, I'd like to ask Fran, um, I spoke with uh, a couple of people that, that deal with facilities and everything that goes into that, and I know it's difficult uh, to predict how it's going to be a month from now, but I think their concern has to do with, you know, <laughs> if we're to order all the stuff that we're going to need to keep it clean and everything else and, and, and spend money that's really not in our budget yet, it's one thing to do that and then the kids coming back, it's another thing to do it and then all of a sudden it's put off another month or a couple of months. How, how difficult and how closely are you working with facilities people to, to get all the, everything that they need to move forward? I believe that every superintendent knows that the sanitizing of the building is incredibly important. And I do believe we're working with um, facilities and superintendents are working with each other. Um, when we talk about this, we talk about regional efforts to work with each other to, and 
and to network to talk about where's the best place to get um, whatever cleaning agents you need. I would say I'd rather be prepared um, and if I have leftovers, I can use them as um, time goes on. But we have to be prepared. And right now, it looks as though we can bring them all back. And I think we need to prepare as if that is what will happen. Fox 61. Uh, my first question is for Fran. So since summer's quickly coming to an end, uh, parents are getting nervous in terms of figuring out back to school plans, if they can go back to work or if they have to plan for daycare on certain days. When is the latest parents can expect a final plan from school districts? Uh, usually what we've been doing is giving uh, folks, um, you know, two to three weeks notice. So our anticipation is um, we're going to be looking at the metrics in early August, and at that point we'll have a go for September. Uh, that said, you know, as Fran has pointed out, and so is uh, Miguel, you know, if things change quickly, and they can, we're looking around the rest of the country, our schools do have a backup plan as needed, but we're going to have the go sign in early August. And then, Governor, you said you'll be announcing that new certification policy. When will it officially be in effect here in Connecticut, or is that going into effect today? No, it's going to take a few days for us to get that implemented. So um, uh, I'd say by the end of this week and certainly for the weekend. Uh, while I've got it, I, I think there was a question for Matt Carter. Is he, is he back? Matt, you may be heard. It was a question, I think, regarding um, the fall, the flu season, and what surprises you or what we should anticipate then. Sorry for disappearing on you. A uh, little problems with my computer at home. I just wanted to uh, remind folks that we are concerned about having a flu season around the same time as COVID-19. With any luck, uh, influenza season will happen when it usually does, which is for us, uh, influenza season usually gets started in late December uh, and uh, goes through January and February. Uh, if uh, we see a resurgence of COVID-19. Uh, it would be better for it to come before that uh, so that they don't overlap. But in preparation for the flu season, we will need to use a, a vaccine uh, so that it'll be easier. You know, we don't want to deal with flu cases at the same time as we're dealing with COVID-19 cases. And Dr. Carter, earlier there was a question relating to the preparedness of schools and what needs to be seen. If you could comment on that as well. Well, I think this is the question that I've, I've watched on the news every night for, for uh, more than 10 days right now. This is the national conversation about how do we open schools. Uh, the key is, is that not to reopen schools when we have uh, widespread community transmission of COVID-19. That's really clear. Uh, well, how to determine when that happens. One of the best measures for that is to look at the percentage of tests that are positive for COVID-19. Governor mentioned that currently we're seeing less than 1% of the tests are, are positive here in Connecticut. In parts of Florida right now, the percentage of positive tests is, what, is over 20%. Uh, we've been there before. We don't want to go back there again. But that's probably one of the best measures of, of, uh, of if, if we're running into trouble. And if the percent positivity goes above 5%, uh, that is very concerning. The uh, same things that we do now are the same things we need to do when schools are reopened. Um, we need to uh, uh, social distance. And I know that that's not easy in a school setting. Um, one thing leads to another. You know, obviously staying six feet apart in schools is difficult. Um, and so uh, the answer to having desks closer together, uh, three feet apart is the need to wear face coverings. I mean, if everybody was six feet apart, we probably wouldn't have to do that. So one of the, each thing leads to another in this case, you know, hand washing obviously, um, and uh, ventilation will be really important as well. And so that can vary from school to school. But clearly, uh, it's, uh, we've all learned that outdoor activities are safer than indoor activities. 
and uh, being in, inside for school is not an easy task. And uh, um, we're all concerned about what happens when the weather gets colder and we're not able to, all of us are not able to spend as much time uh, outdoors as we currently are. WTIC 1080 News. Good afternoon, Dr. Carter. Based on your research early on, you said there might be 100 cases for every single known case. So now we have 48,000 known cases. What's your best estimate on what we might have in reality? Well, it assumes that the reality today is the same as the reality back in in February when they, I said that outside the governor's mansion at a press conference. At that point in time, very little testing was being done and available in Connecticut or anywhere in the United States for that matter. And so when we were able to confirm a case, it was quite likely that there was at least 100 people who were infected. Now that we have many more testing is much more widely available the current estimate and this is consistent with the uh, cdc guidelines is that we probably have 10 people who are infected for every case that's confirmed and the reason for this is because testing is much more widely available now and if you think about it uh, we have about 500 new cases a week so what that means is around 5,000 new infections probably every week and I'd like to point out to folks that, that if you had said this to me back in, in March and April, that uh, um, we'd be seeing this level of, of transmission in July, uh, I would have said, I hope not. Um, because at that time we were thinking, I mean, the only pandemic we had any experience with was influenza. And influenza, uh, pandemics come in waves and uh, disappear in the summer when it's warm. And uh, that did not happen with, with COVID-19. This virus is not influenza. And we're seeing levels of transmission which are higher than what we, uh, uh, we had hoped for. Um, it turned out that uh, the influenza model was not the right one. It was the only one we had, however, to judge by. Um, so. In answer to your question, it's uh, right now uh, we're assuming 10 to 1, uh, which is also consistent with national recommendations. So for every confirmed case, there's probably 10 people who are infected. So 48,000 is an estimated 480,000, which is one out of every five, six people in the state. Well, remember, I, I, right now, what's important is who's infected now not how many people have been infected. Um, the only way to determine that is to do what's called a seroprevalence study. And if you recall, a couple of weeks ago, we uh, uh, talked about the CDC study that estimated that around 4. I think 8% of our population uh, has already been uh, infected with uh, COVID-19, with the, this virus. So that's where we are overall, but right now, um, for every, when you see that we have 100 new cases in a week, um, you can assume that, or 100 new cases in a day, that there's probably 10 times that many. Thank you. You're welcome. The Associated Press. Uh, thanks, Max. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Carter, I was wondering if you could continue on with that a little bit. What are your thoughts about what we can expect for a second wave? When might it happen and how bad might it be? Well, what's been, what's been happening recently, there's lots of discussion going on about whether or not it's even appropriate to talk about waves anymore. Waves was a concept from influenza pandemics. And it may well be uh, that we have ongoing of transmission uh, all through the year. Some parts of the United States, uh, with it'll be uh, low like it is in Connecticut right now, and other uh, other parts of, Connecticut, uh, of the country, it may be uh, surging. And so um, we may not see distinct waves. Uh, it's clearly the southern states and the western states, uh, this looks like it's all part of one single wave although from their perspective, 
it looks like a, a small wave in the spring and then a, a much larger resurgence. I think uh, it's probably better to stop thinking about waves and it is likely that we will see a resurgence exactly when. Uh, none of us can predict, but we are trying to figure out better ways to know when it's about to happen so that we can implement control measures. And do you expect the resurgence to be anywhere near what it's been already here in Connecticut? We must have, we've learned so much since over the we last have, few months. But remember that only less than 5% of our population have already had the infection. And uh, there's a, this virus is just interested in infecting people. And uh, there's uh, um, a lot more of us who haven't been infected. I think uh, clearly our goal and the reason why social distancing is so important, and this is not the time to relax uh, at all, is to try to blunt the resurgence when it occurs. Um, we know what works. We know that uh, social distancing, uh, staying home if you, if you, if you can, uh, and if you can't to wear masks, uh, try to, especially during the summer months, uh, be out, outdoors, outdoor activities, avoid uh, congregate settings indoors, groups of large groups of people indoors. And if we continue to do that, it would, uh, I think, go a long ways in terms of uh, blunting um, a, a, res you know, a resurgence. I don't expect us to go down to zero and like stay there for a little while. I expect us to have, right now, if you've noticed, we have averaged around you know, 70 to 80 uh, uh, hospitalizations a day, people in hospital a day. Um, our case numbers have stayed about the same, sort of 80 to 100 new cases a day. Um, I think it's gonna stay that way uh, and until it starts to go up. Whether it goes up sharply or gradually is, a lot, is really up to us and, and what we do. And Governor, thank you for that, Doctor. Uh, Governor, I've been told uh, that some testing sites and doctors who use commercial labs like Quest for the PCR diagnostic COVID tests, they're experiencing really lengthy processing, processing delays, like about two weeks. I was wondering if you were aware of this and should people who want to get timely results, should they be going to local labs instead of these commercial ones? Uh, yeah, I am aware of that. So. Um... Quest has uh, been overloaded. Uh, they've got uh, uh, some long lead times for those that use them. We have a contract with Quest, as you know, but we also work uh, mainly with a lot of local labs here in the state. So probably over time, we're going to prioritize that. That which we can control, we'll have a lot faster turnaround on all that testing. And then perhaps we can spread that to some of the primary care folks as well. What should people do in the meantime if they want to get a, a, a test quickly and that's accurate? Want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, they can they can uh, ask the the testing site that they're planning to go to. You know, what what lab they work with. That's something that could be shared. And uh, right now, as as you mentioned, uh, it's pretty well known that that some of the large commercial labs, Quest in particular, are quite behind. Thank you very much, everyone. The day of New London. Governor, I um, just wanted to ask uh, what your latest thinking might be about phase three. Uh, anything, uh, any thoughts about the bars, the inside dining and whatnot, uh, a date for that yet? No, I think we'll probably give some guidance in early August along the side, same time that we're talking about the schools. Um, again, you saw us point out that California has now closed down indoor dining. Um, so my hunch is, uh, at this point, I don't see any reason to um, make big changes, but we'll have clear guidance in the next uh, few weeks on that. Okay, thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Um, so this question is for Dr. Carter. Is the state tracking infection rates among the hospital staff, and, and what does that look like? Uh, we are not tracking. Uh, infection rates among hospital staff. That's up to the individual hospitals. Okay. Um, and so there's no reason that they should be reporting that to the state then? We uh, receive reports about positive cases where they occur, but we don't necessarily receive information about what their occupation is. Okay. And uh, how is the contact tracing program going? 
Well, actually, we're very fortunate. Uh, contact tracing works best when the number of cases is low and the number of contacts is manageable. Uh, and so this is the best time to be doing contact tracing. It doesn't work very well when you have the kind of case numbers that are being seen in Texas or Florida. But right now, this is the perfect time and uh, our local health departments uh, and are working to uh, identify contacts in every case. And uh, we're being quite successful in reaching most of them. Uh, and so we should take advantage of this time to try to use contact tracing to drive down the rates. Um, is there a percentage? What, what are we for responses? Yeah. Josh has those numbers. Yep. The, the latest numbers for last week um, is that we were um, uh, over 90% again of cases uh, contact within 48 hours. Similar to the prior week, about half of those uh, successfully contacted and provided contacts to us. And then of those contacts, again, over 95% of those uh, followed up within 48 hours and about half of those successfully contacted as well. So each week the metrics have gotten better and better and that's really a testament to Dr. Carter, his team at DPH and our partners in the local health departments who are continuing to uh, adopt the process, get better and better at it each week, more resources brought to bear. We're now over 900 uh, tracers registered in the system. So I think very good progress from the team. Thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. The Waterbury Republican American. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, this is for Dr. Carter. Uh, we've been getting some reader questions about the definition of a confirmed death versus a, a probable death. Um, I, I know some of the guidelines has changed over the last several weeks or months. Perhaps you could uh, give us a refresher. Sure. Uh, a confirmed death is uh, somebody uh, who passed away and who had around the time of death had a positive test for a COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV virus. Um, and what we found, uh, not just in Connecticut, but nationally as well, is back in April, uh, as you know, there were so many deaths that occurred that uh, and many of those, uh, for example, in long-term care facilities and involving people who had a symptom, an illness consistent with COVID-19, but uh, were not for, for whatever reasons were not tested. And so the, uh, in those cases, the uh, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner determined uh, if based on uh, the symptoms and what was going on in the facility, for example, uh, that uh, someone uh, could, a death could be considered a probable death due to COVID-19. And, so, and so clearly uh, this was necessary because of if we just counted on laboratory confirmations, we would have missed many of the deaths that occurred that probably were related to COVID-19, uh, but involved people who were never tested for the virus. Uh, thank you. Uh, I believe uh, this might be a question for Josh. CBS um, says it stopped doing rapid testing at its New Haven site at the end of June. It now encourages people to go to its 27 drive through stations. It says it has the capacity to 50 tests a day at each site. Is that enough to meet the demand? Um, well, CVS uh, in their retail uh, testing capabilities is just one of the many uh, testing partners we have in the state. So we have over 160 sites in total. Um, so CVS is just one piece of the puzzle, an important one, and we greatly appreciate their support. But if anyone has symptoms or needs to get tested, we'd recommend, as always, they either call 211 or go on the 211 website, punch in your zip code, and with so many testing sites around the country, you'll be very easily find uh, one close to you. And I'd like to follow up with the governor on the question about uh, car travelers, because it's just not people from Florida. There are many people in Connecticut who uh, have places in South Carolina and in North Carolina. Um, why aren't we taking a look at car travelers, or is it just too difficult to 
or too large a group to uh, get our uh, arms around. I don't know if it's too large a group, but we certainly sent the message loud and clear that if you're coming back to the state uh, from one of those uh, highly infected areas, you must quarantine. Um, uh, we're not tracking down every out-of-state license plate, though. You're right about that. Uh, and why not? Uh, I think our priority is going to be certainly in the airlines, easier to track. We know the group of people as they're coming in. I think uh, that's where you're going to get the most bang for the buck. Okay, thank you very much. The Hartford Current. Hi, Governor. Um, would you mind talking a little bit more about your consideration in whether to impose fines or some other kind of um, punishment on people who don't quarantine? You kind of hinted that maybe you were, you were thinking about that. Um, what are your thoughts there? My thoughts are we haven't had to do that uh, to date when it came to masks, when it came to safe store rules, when it came to, uh, you know, preliminary quarantining. But we did want to send a strong message that we are taking this seriously and you should take it seriously. So before you get on that plane in Miami Beach to come up to Bradley Airport, know that we will be asking you where you plan to self-quarantine. Make sure that you're taking this seriously. And let's see how that goes for a couple of weeks. We find we um, still have a lot of leaks in the bucket. Uh, we can think about, um, you know, other disincentives to make sure people take it even more seriously. Got it. And Dr. Carter, it's good to see you. Um, I wanted to clarify something that, that you said. Um, you said that only 5% of the state has had COVID, if I heard you right. But if uh, we have 10 infections for every um, positive case, then it, that would seem to be a lot more than 5% of the state. So could you just kind of clarify um, what that number might be, what our best guess is? Oh, I still think it's 5% of the state. What I'm saying is right now, I think we should assume that for every new case of COVID-19 that's uh, reported to us, there's another 10 people who are infected. But if it... I'm not applying 10 to the whole denominator of the total number of cases. But previously, for every one case that was reported, it was even more than 10 who were infected, right, when testing was lower. That's correct. But so but that would seem to me, but maybe I'm wrong, but that would seem to add up to more than 5%, but you don't think so? Um, well, 10% of the population is a lot of people. Um, uh, I mean, 5%. And yeah. so uh, I'd be happy to talk more about the numbers. Um, yeah you know, on a in different, different forum. But uh, if you recall, 10 is the number that's currently used, being used by the federal government uh, for the ratio between um, infected to uh, reported cases. Mm -hmm. I have one more question for you. Um, there's a lot of talk about whether college sports should go on this uh, fall. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the risks of bringing a sports team together and having it travel all around and what you would say to an athletic director or to a college sports executive who's trying to make that decision? Well, I'd like to remind folks um, that uh, you're asking a question of, a, of an epidemiologist and <laughs> epidemiologists never use the word safe ever. Um, <laughs> we can say that something is safer um, and that's our goal is to try to make, uh, for example, schools as safe as possible. But for most folks, being safe means zero risk. And we're in the middle of a pandemic and there is no way that we can make the risk zero. And so uh, to answer your question, uh, mm -hmm. we have to ask ourselves uh, as a society, uh, are sports uh, important enough that we're willing to accept the risk uh, that people involved in those sports might come down with COVID-19. Thank you. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hi, Governor. It's Caitlin Krasselt. A um, couple of questions for you. The first is um, regarding the um, the mandatory quarantine. You mentioned um, if you see some leaks, continue to see some leaks in the bucket. Have there been reports of people not um, adhering to the mandatory quarantine when they arrive here? Just anecdotal uh, that not everybody automatically uh, self-quarantines. It is voluntary. So this is just one more level of a strong reminder how important it is. Um, and um, for Dr. Carter, 
Uh, I know that there are there's been some research as to different strains of the virus. Um, is that important um, when you're tracking the virus, and is there a way to determine um, what strains are spreading? Well, there's really two strains. There's the what we call the Wuhan strain, the original strain from China, mm -hmm. and there's the European strain. Uh, but we know now that in Connecticut, and, and researchers of Yale have shown this to be true, is that the original cases in, in Connecticut were actually uh, uh, caused by travel from the West Coast. And they were the Wuhan strain of the virus. But for all of, the, all of us who remember what it was like uh, when uh, the New York City outbreak exploded in Westchester County, uh, and uh, moved into Fairfield County. Uh, uh, New York cases were actually caused by the strain in Europe, from Europe, which we now know appears to be more easily transmissible from person than the strain from the home. And so there's no evidence at this point that it's more, that, it, that the illness it causes is any more or less severe, but it is more easily transmitted from person. So right now, we're, we're dealing in Connecticut, the European strain. So this was the strain that went from Wuhan to, to Europe, from Europe to New York City, and then from New York City to New Jersey and Connecticut and the rest of the Northeast. Okay. Um, okay, and um, sorry, back to the, to the governor. Um, the, as you mentioned, California um, is uh, going backwards and um, in, in its phases. Um, when you're considering Connecticut's phases, are you um, looking only at our data here, or could there be, um, you know, what data in other areas would prompt you to, um, you know, either move backwards here or reconsider things like reopening schools? Well, certainly slowing up in terms of phase three and bars and increasing mm -hmm. capacity in restaurants were um, less impacted by exactly what's going on here since we have a very, very low infection rate right now. But learning from what's going on in other parts of the country where you saw bars and um, uh, crowded restaurants could really have an infectious uh, multiplier. So uh, we are learning from them and that is impacting us. Is there, is there a specific data point um, or data level that you would, um, you know, shut down indoor dining completely here or go backwards in, in any capacity? Uh, I would worry if I saw the acceleration that I saw in Phoenix and Miami, uh, not that they uh, went up past, say, 3% or 5%, but how fast that hockey stick swung up. Uh, that would mean we would have to respond quickly. And as I said early on, when it comes to um, – what we want to do here, we want to proceed cautiously just so we don't have to backtrack. And uh, so far, so good. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Hi. Um, Dr. Carter, can you give us a sense of the impact on the delays in Quest and the other commercial labs uh, because of the demands in other states? Um, what is the impact on uh, the accuracy of the seven-day rolling average in Connecticut right now. You got a feel for that? Um, it could, it's, it's a good question. We are uh, talking about this earlier today. Uh, the majority of uh, the laboratory tests that we receive, the results uh, we receive is our from Quest. Uh, and one of the things that we're in the process of doing is trying to shift the uh, testing uh, over to the other contract labs that the state has. Uh, the, the contract labs are all in state and don't involve sending uh, specimens out uh, to to Quest, which, it, which uh, Quest is dealing with uh, a national uh, testing uh, shortage. Uh, I think this is a bigger issue. I understand the question about seven seven day rolling average. We'll look into it. I don't know, have an exact answer to your question, but there's probably some effect. Um, I think this is a bigger issue across the way for all of us is, is whether or not uh, uh, we're going to continue to be able to do as many tests as we want here in Connecticut, because it is clear that there are uh, strains on the supply chain for uh, 
test kits and test agents that are going to affect the entire country. And what does that do to the contact tracing? I guess that's an obvious enough follow-up. Well, right now um, we're doing uh, we're we're checking with our contract labs uh, and at the state lab we're doing an inventory to see how many days of testing we have available with resources that are on hand. Uh, I can say that uh, we're good for the next uh, month or so, uh, at least at the state public health laboratory. Part of the issue is, is that there, there are so many parts to testing. If you remember back in, in, uh, in, in March and April, that any single, a shortage of any single piece of necessary uh, reagents could cause the whole chain to uh, come to a halt. So uh, we'll have a better idea once we finish our tour with the other contract labs. And you said Quest is, does the majority of the testing here. Do, what is your sense as to what is the, how long does it take for the majority of those tests that Quest does? Right now, um, we actually uh, trying to remember the data from a presentation I saw this morning. Um, we're not seeing the same kind of delays that are being seen in other parts of the country yet with Quest. Um, and uh, overall, we're still getting uh, results back into our contact tracing system after between two and three days. And that includes Quest. Yeah, I think it's important to note that our state contract with Quest that was negotiated very skillfully by the Comptroller, Comptroller Lembo um, prioritize the Connecticut samples in the in the top tier, which which require rapid turnaround. Um, Quest is, as they've grown increasingly overwhelmed, uh, been looking for states like us to provide them some relief on that, and that's why we're looking to redirect. So I think at this point in time, I think the the impact on turnaround times for the state of Connecticut, and particularly the the testing done through our, our state contract, is is minimal. Um, but it's really anticipating what could come next that we're we're trying to respond to. Okay, final question from Fran. What, what are the superintendents telling you as far as a hard date that they're going to need to have as far as direction on do they plan on a hybrid situation or everybody comes back? I believe that while they're planning for the three models, um, I believe the governor spoke about a an early um, August date, I think that would be fair to not just the superintendents, but the families as well in order to make plans um, for opening at the end of August, however we open. Thank you, everybody. All right, well, look, Fran, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Carter, uh, one thing you said I'll always remember is I'm an epi epidemiologist. We never use the word safe. We do use the it. word safer and how we can stay relatively safer. Uh, one thing you probably saw in the um, uh, early graph we had was the day we implemented um, mandatory wearing masks. That was uh, April 20th. For the next three months, our hospitalizations have gone down since that date. And what a difference it makes. It does make you safer. As you know, we've had a little bit of a competition about who can come up with the best uh, story about uh, wearing the mask. Uh, on our Twitter account, we have our friends from the play Hamilton who submitted their um, effort. And here's uh, Stu Leonard, our, uh, our locally owned, on why to wear the mask. asking Stu, do I really need to wear a mask to the grocery store? Everyone should wear a mask. That way we reduce the spread of the virus, protect our store workers, and keep getting you everything from fresh produce to apple cider donut holes and banana bread. <laughs> We've seen you try to make your own banana bread. <laughs> this is why you leave it to the pros. Uh, he's a kick. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.